So we're going to move a little bit into more technology instead of technique. Um, and again, I'm honored to be sort of in between Dr. Polly, uh, Jens Chapman, and Dr. Theodore, uh, a really a forerunner in uh, robotics. So uh, hopefully a lot of the attendees are interested in new technologies, considering new technologies, and that might include robotics, which is still sort of in its infancy. And I wanted to just share with you a little bit about uh, my experience with robotics and how it's been uh, impactful for my career. Um, this is a very short talk, uh, but there is a YouTube video that's a fully edited video of an MIS TLIF uh, using a robot for assistance. And I encourage all the attendees to look that up if you want to see the entire workflow of a robotic-assisted lumbar fusion. Uh, so why did I get into robotics or why did I become interested in robotics? Well, I think we have to sort of look at ourselves and decide what we're looking for. And I'm a private practice neurosurgeon and finished in 1998, so I'm one of the older guys now. I have always had a career as a community hospital, uh, lumbar degenerative practice, um, but I was a very early adopter for MIS techniques and an early adopter of image guidance techniques. And Rod probably really doesn't remember this, but I think I met him about 15 years ago at an MIS course, uh, even before robotics was in play. Uh, but we all know as spine surgeons, whether you do MIS, open, deformity, we still use a lot of intraoperative fluoroscopy, even with uh, the value of image guidance. We do spins, we do uh, shots during the placement, we do spins afterwards. And like all orthopedic and neurosurgeons, I know how to put in a pedicle screw. And, and that's sometimes the battle we have with uh, new technologies, looking within ourselves and challenging ourselves to be a better surgeon. So what was I looking for in robotics and why did I look into it very carefully a couple of years ago? Uh, very simple, I just wanted to improve my techniques. Uh, TLIF is a workhorse in my practice for a lumbar degenerative spine, uh, predominantly MIS and image guidance. So, but I wanted to be better. I, I thought I was having really great results, but I wanted to be better. Um, but I was also using uh, technology such as robotics to look for an advantage in percutaneous screws to augment lateral procedures, anterior procedures, uh, and traumatic procedures. Uh, again, not doing a ton of uh, deformity. You, you can see that's missing from my talk. But I wanted to be able to improve my techniques, but yet minimize changes to my workflows. We all hate to change our workflows. It, it slows us down. It might compromise our effectiveness. So I was looking for the technology uh, and adapt it to my practice to minimize changes. I wanted to improve my screw uh, placement. I wanted to reduce fluoroscopy. On a side note, I'm the son of an interventional radiologist who's retired and he's in his mid 80s. And about 10 to 15 years ago, uh, my dad really told me to be careful about the radiation I was doing to myself over a career. And he had about five or six colleagues or partners who were developing bone marrow cancers thought to be related to exposure, uh, a lot of exposure for radiation. I wanted to be able to help myself with more challenging cases, revisions, uh, short segment lumbar degenerative deformities. And I needed something to get excited about for maybe the last 10 or 15 years of my career. I'd gotten a little bit bored, quite frankly, with sort of MIS and image guidance. So that led me to look at and investigate the different robotic systems in about 2017. And at that time, there were only two. Uh, we ultimately required a third generation, our first robot in August of 2018, and then quickly upgraded to the fourth generation robot in 2019. And so over a year and a half, minus three months of COVID, uh, we have nearly a hundred case uh, series now of uh, robotic spinal fusions. So uh, this is just a, a snapshot of what a robotic system would look like. Uh, in the middle there, you see a workstation. The workstation contains the image-guided software system. Uh, you see on the right, a robotic arm, in this particular case, attached to and mounted on the operating room bed, uh, or there is a version that is a uh, floor mounted. And then because there's image guidance to use live navigation, there is always an optical camera. So it's really three basic components to a robotic-assisted image guidance system. The principles are really the same uh, depending on the systems. Uh, the first is a robust computer software package uh, to do surgical planning. And I think Jens has already mentioned it, Dr. Polly's mentioned it, uh, so that we can do the full breadth of planning of this operation prior to the operating room, prior to the patient in the operating room, and we can do it in the comfort of my office on the computer. 
And that includes placement of instrumentation, pedicle screws predominantly, a placement of the skin incisions precisely, especially if you're thinking about MIS type of techniques, placement and sizing of the inner body spacers in the cages. And the two types of processes to get to that point is to first either use a preoperative thin cut uh, CT scan, uh, and then the software loads that information and you place all the screws virtually using the software package. And we merge that with an intraoperative set of fluoroscopic images. That's one software plan uh, workflow. The other is to do a cone beam intraoperative CT scan uh, using an O-arm or any other similar devices uh, so that the intraoperative x-rays can be merged with the preoperative x-rays and CT scan, and that gets to the planning of the accurate placement of screws. And then the really slick part is the computer and software engineers have designed a registration software that essentially merges those two image sets uh, so that we can plan screws and then let the robot execute the screws. It allows us to continue a very efficient and reproducible workflow of placing instruments. And I'll, and I'll show you at, uh, near the end where we can probably simplify and reduce the number of steps because of the computerized planning and the accuracy. The addition of image guidance allows us immediate visualization and confirmation of the screw placement using image guidance software. And again, these systems were designed in such a way that it's open, uh, it's available for both open and MIS techniques or platforms. You'll see a few snapshots of one particular system. Uh, this is the workflow on the computer uh, for this particular robot system. We've loaded a preoperative CT scan uh, into the computer software. We do simple steps and within five minutes can plan a one level or two level pedicle screw instrumented fusion. We approve the orientation uh, of the spinal anatomy. We mark the region of interest. And then the software uh, provides what's called segmentation. This particular system will then take the spine and take out each individual spinal segment and then allow us to have axial, coronal, and sagittal views uh, for us to identify the individual vertebral segment and then ultimately to position the screws by size, by system, by trajectory, length, uh, diameter. It is amazing after doing spine surgery for almost 30 years, I almost almost uniformly put in five, five screws at most locations, six, five screws at L5, seven, five screws at the sacrum. And unless you do the computerized uh, uh, study of the CT scan ahead of time, you don't realize that some pedicles barely take a five, five screw or some screws and take a much bigger screw. So it's been interesting to see the individualized pedicle anatomy. Once we virtually place the screws, we can see a summary detail both in the AP and lateral views, and we can start to see the alignment of the rod. We can actually adjust the screw insertion side and entry side uh, so that particularly in MIS cases, we can make nice linear incisions and make it much more easy and technically feasible and efficient to pass the rods. And then for deformity cases, there are software packages that allow predictable and preoperative correction of the uh, spinal deformity. So we can place inner body spacers, hyperlordotic cages, we can make osteotomies virtually on the software planning station and then see what the spine should look like once the robot executes the placement of the instrumentation. Here's a quick snapshot of what it might look like in the axial view placing uh, uh, virtual screws at L4 uh, and in the sagittal view. And if we go down to L5, we can see we start to see the iliac crest over here. And occasionally the iliac crest actually gets in the way of an L5 screw, potentially an L4 screw. And there's already been a lot of talk about the S2 and AI instrumentation. And robotics is absolutely a beautiful technique to help reduce the stress and the strain of doing that technique and putting those screws in because you can plan the screws on the software package off of a preoperative CT scan and the robot executes it to perfection. The OR setup is pretty standard. The patient's prone on a Jackson or a Jackson type table. In this particular system, the workstation is usually at the foot of the bed. You can see the robotic arm attached to the operating room table or in the other major system, it's floor mounted here at the foot of the bed and then the uh, image guidance optical camera. Well, when do I use the robot? 
Uh, I use it for every instrumented lumbar fusion, whether it's primary revisions. And I like to tell the story that uh, as an MIS image guided guy, I literally flipped the switch from navigated image guidance to robots from one case. Uh, and I haven't looked back to my old navigated image guidance system because that's how much I believe in the accuracy of the software, the registration, and the execution by the robot. Again, my workhorse procedure is a T-lift, so I use it for every single T-lift. I use it for dual position lateral lumbar fusion, so percutaneous screw placement uh, stage after a lateral fusion. I will use it for multi-level A-lifts, uh, and I will use it for trauma where I may uh, find the benefit of percutaneous screw fixation. So virtually any operation where you need pedicle screw instrumentation, uh, you can use the robot. The workflow goes something like this. The patient's position, the robot is brought in and mounted. The patient and robot are draped at the same time, again, to improve the efficiency. I like to get uh, autologous iliac crest with a little MIS device from the PSIS. I use tubular retractors placed under serum fluoroscopy, do my ipsilateral decompression, contralateral decompression, and then my disc space preparation. A lot of techniques I learned from Dr. Polly specifically. We'll do implant trialing, place the inner body cage in a T-lift or PLIF type technique, and then I remove the tubular retractor. And like some of our image guidance colleagues, that's when I bring the image guidance and the robotic system in. The robot that I use attaches to a pin through the PSIS, and now actually the fun really begins with robotics. Once you mount the robot, there is a series of steps to try to essentially uh, register all of the technologies together. So within about a five minute time period, we mount the robot to the patient. We attach all of the different parts to the robot, including the IGS reference array, the end effector through which the tools go. We define the regional anatomy. We register the instruments on the fly, and then we register the image guidance system register the robot, and then we marry those two registrations together. And those steps take about five minutes. And then the software allows us to register that pre-op or interoperative CT to a couple of spot fluoro images, and that's where it matches and merges the skeletal anatomy. The placement of the instrumentation is efficient, uh, so it goes something like this. We direct the robot to go to the first planned screw position, a navigated dilator and cannula go, goes down through the soft tissues to the pedicle entry site. And by the way, this is without any retractor system. And then through the cannula, we insert a nice little drill guide or an anchor. The drill is then put in under power and under live navigation. We can then tap with live navigation under power and then place the screw under uh, live navigation. I like to use the ATS or the all-tap screws. Uh, the technology for that thread pitch makes it very efficient to put the screw in under power. And most of the times, even in young healthy bone, I've skipped tapping the pedicle and I save a little bit more bone for the bone screw interface. Uh, I simply still take a lateral quick fluoro image just to make sure that screw is in appropriate position. And then I move the robot to the second position and repeat those four steps. I take a final AP and lateral fluoro prior to placing the rods uh, and then after placing the rods. And while this looks like it's a lot of steps, you can see that we've eliminated using the ball probes, uh, the uh, awls, uh, and all of those things uh, uh, because of the image guidance the, uh, uh, confirmation and the accuracy of the robotic execution. This is a very short video just to show the simple steps of putting in the screws the robot's already been moved to the desired position, and through a little MIS uh, uh, incision that's already been performed, we'll uh, watch. That's the navigatable uh, cannula uh, and dilator, and I'm sliding the cannula down through the soft tissues, and I'm looking at the uh, screen so that I can see the planned screw is the yellow, and the live navigatable soft tissue dilator was that blue instrument. I'm taking out the uh, dilator and through the cannula, I drill a little anchor and tap the drill guide in. The anchor is removed and under power, again with live navigation confirmation, a small pilot hole is drilled. I look over and again can confirm the live navigatable drill is the blue instrument perfectly along the path that was planned of the yellow screw.
By the way, for those of you using power for your drills, your taps and screws is really nice. It can save your carpal tunnel syndrome or your wrist and hand osteoarthritis as you get into your 50s and 60s. The cannula now is removed. And again, without any soft tissue dilation under power, the pedicle screw is placed through the end effector and confirmed with live navigation. And you can watch that on the uh, sterile screen that's right there in the field. And so that, that video isn't uh, sped up in any way, shape, or form. So again, you can see a very efficient workload, even though we're adding uh, some significant technology. Uh, we do have to be prepared uh, for skiving, and skiving is when the screw goes off of the plan. Uh, those of you that are image guidance folks understand the process of skiving. So we've developed a workflow based on our experience on what to do if there's a skive. Um, and then this uh, slide really identifies the new vocabulary we use now with robotically placed instrumentation. Uh, so skiving is when the uh, screw is a, a bit off of the plan. Shift is where the soft tissue can potentially move the spine and create some potential inaccuracies. And variance is the term about a visual perception where the plan screw and the virtual screw doesn't completely map. And so we have a series of techniques that we've sort of learned uh, with experience on how to avoid skiving, how to reduce uh, skiving. And, and these tips I think are very helpful no matter what robotic system you use. Uh, one of the robotic systems has a force meter on the end effector that can help visually uh, understand the concept of skive. So real quick, a couple of cases uh, that I think are great cases to use a robot and image guidance for lumbar fusion. And these are probably the straightforward cases that early in your experience, I think surgeons should consider. Here is a patient with a transitional anatomy, a grade two spondylolisthesis and severe stenosis, uh, movement on flexion and extension x-rays, who's under going to undergo an MIS decompression instrumented inner body fusion with robotic assistance screw placement. This is what the plan looks like on the uh, workstation. And here's the interoperative x-rays immediately after placement of the uh, rod screw construct with a nice reduction of the spondosthesis, a big spacer, and accurately placed screws. The next is a little bit more challenging case of a grade two, almost three ismic spondy, big tall guy, six foot three, 260 pounds, uh, little teeny weeny pedicles at L5, and certainly placing in pedicle screws, whether it's open or MIS, would be challenging in this case. But with the added confidence of the computer software program and planning, you can see really tiny screws there at L5 because that's all the spinal anatomy would allow. And I think without the planning softwares and studying these preoperative CT scans, I would have likely put one screw size bigger and I would have had less chances of accurately placing that screw and as you know, with some of these pedicles, you get one shot to put in a good uh, fixation pedicle screw. So this is an MIS PLIF technique with uh, MIS technique, tubular retractors, robotic assistance, uh, and inner body spacers with a great uh, radiographic result. This guy's only about six months out and doing fantastic. Uh, as an augment to lateral procedures, this is a woman who had a couple of endoscopic left-sided L34 procedures. Uh, she did quite well, but you can see she's developed asymmetric collapse at L34 on the left and has uh, progressively uh, developed chronic back and intractable leg pain. Here's her MRI scan, and here's the foramen that had been treated a couple of times endoscopically. So I like the opportunity to use lateral inner body fusions for indirect decompression. Uh, doesn't need a direct decompression, doesn't need a posterior approach. So I did a lateral inner body fusion at L34. Uh, and then in a dual position, we fill up her prone, attach the robot, and put in the uh, percutaneously placed pedicle screws. If you're a midline or cortical screw type of surgeon, uh, the robot is an excellent way to adapt the technology to that technique. So here's a case I borrowed from Dr. Jeff Gunn, uh, L45 spondos thesis with kyphosis and foraminal narrowing, uh, facet fluid and instability. Uh, he likes the cortical screw trajectory, and this is a plan of cortical screws for L45 spondylolisthesis and his postoperative x-rays uh, about a year out. 
So you can see just by those couple of cases, and, and I didn't have any deformity cases to show, but I think that's even more powerful for deformity cases uh, where we need to put in A2, uh, S2 AI screws, uh, or your uh, newer technique that Dr. Polly described and Dr. Chapman showed. Uh, but it's a wonderful technology to use for any place you're going to put in posterior lumbar pedicle screws. So my personal observations after about a year and a half and nearly 100 cases, absolute precision accuracy with screw placement. Uh, I'm embarrassed to be in front of Dr. Theodore, but his system and the data is really showing that our accuracy for pedicle screws with robotics is really in the upper 90%. And that's pretty hard to beat, uh, even if you're a good freehand surgeon, 2D fluoro or image guidance. The preoperative planning helps me become more standardized with my instrumentation placement rather than sort of planning on the fly. That's what we do as surgeons and that's okay. But again, I was looking for a way to make myself a better surgeon. The registration software in these systems is amazing and is really critical to the advantage uh, of the robotic technique and helping us as spine surgeons. I have dramatically reduced my radiation exposure, uh, even more so than what I did with uh, image guidance. And again, I think I've showed a very standardized execution of placing instrumentation. I think it's fewer steps. It's fewer chances of uh, losing bone and bone quality. It allows you to improve your confidence for your preoperative planning, especially for deformities. It substantially reduces the stress of placing the screws while you're placing the screws. And ultimately, I think there's some efficiencies for implant selection, reducing the number of trays that are brought to the operating room, supply chain issues, and potentially moving instrumented lumbar fusions into the outpatient setting. You can expect shorter OR times and robot times with more experience and efficiencies. For sure, like any other new technique and technology, it's gonna add a little time at the beginning. Most of the robotic surgeons I know say that the learning curve is much less than 20 cases. In some cases around, uh, in some experiences, five to 10 cases uh, for busy uh, instrumented spine surgeons, that's probably only a month or two of experience. Uh, we have learned that uh, for open TLIF uh, surgeons, it's a little bit of a harder transition uh, to move into robotics than the MIS. It's not because of the robot, it's really still about the soft tissue envelope uh, and how we try to protect retracting the soft tissues without moving the spine, and they're decreasing our accuracy uh, of placing screws. What I found to be important as I teach courses uh, for robotics is the robotic platform may actually be the avenue for surgeons to add skills like MIS and image guidance. Uh, you know, there's still a, a very paucity of surgeons using MIS and still a paucity of surgeons uh, using image guidance techniques, despite all of these wonder fac wonderful faculty teaching all these techniques. And so robotics may actually be a way for surgeon attendees out there to be able to uh, add value to your practice with MIS and image guidance techniques. And certainly I mentioned with deformities, with revisions, and uh, putting in screws that we're not as familiar with, such as the S2 AI screws, robotics can be a tremendous asset for that. And while as surgeons, we don't like to talk about marketing, it is a marketing uh, uh, event. So patients who have surgeries will become advocates of the technology. They become advocates of your technique as a surgeon and your practice. And hospital systems and groups can certainly differentiate themselves. With that, I always like to conclude with keys to success for those surgeons who are considering robotics uh, or who are early in their experience of robotics. Uh, it doesn't matter how good the robot are. If you pick the wrong patient, it will fail. Uh, so I would strongly suggest robotic early surgeons use primary surgeries before revisions, consider the lower BMI patient, consider degenerative cases before deformity cases. One level and two level are certainly easier to do than five, six, seven, eight, or 10 levels, even though you might actually find more efficiencies with the longer constructs. I certainly don't uh, impose my technique on anyone else, and each surgeon has to figure out what works best for you. I always advise to avoid too many techniques at one time. We tend to struggle if we add too many techniques, we get frustrated, and then all we wanna do is blame the technology or the company, or even better yet, the sales rep in the room. With robotics specifically, I like to convey that, that do a dry run or a walk through the team. Uh, Dr. Johnson's uh, partner, Dr. Kim, is someone who I worked with prior to their first robotic. 
cases and doing a dry run through with your entire team, the OR team, the robotic specialists, the surgeons and the reps can be helpful. Work very, very closely with all of your uh, colleagues. Uh, and please take advantage of all the resources out there. There are tons of courses for robotics, whether they're industry-sponsored cadaver labs, society workshops, the wonderful uh, Seattle Science Foundation. Uh, reach out to uh, key opinion leaders like Dr. Theodore. Uh, there's lots of videos out there. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. Uh, and the final plug is there's a, a very well done edited video of an MIST lift uh, using the robot that you can find on YouTube uh, under my channel. And again, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's an amazing honor for me to be a part of an SSF uh, program, especially with this uh, distinguished faculty. Uh, and uh, if there's time, I'll be happy to answer questions now and I'm gonna stay on for the rest of the course. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we're a little bit behind time, so allow me moderator's prerogative and ask you one question. The advantage of having a high reliability instrumentation uh, with an MIS uh, uh, approach would be, for instance, to use a robot with a patient in a lateral decubitus position and do same position posterior instrumentation and anterolateral fixation and caging. And just to give you an example, one of our wonderful fellows, Dr. Bilal Kutena, who's going to uh, graduate uh, today a little bit early, he's heading to his new fellowship. Dr. Skaggs will be happy. He's doing a pediatric fellowship at CHOP next uh, after spending a year with us. Um, so he's, for instance, just been used to doing lateral position surgeries using a robotic technique, right, Bilal? So do you use this? Do you do same uh, position, lateral and posterior instrumentations? And isn't this one of the great advantages, theoretically, of having a robot? It, it absolutely is. Um, the, the challenge for me is I'm one of the old guys, and I've been doing lateral surgery for quite a while. So my OR team is actually very efficient. So the, the reason to do single position lateral is the efficiency. You, ha you don't have to flip and all that delay. In my OR, to be honest with you, it takes less than 15 minutes to do a flip from lateral to prone. So while I think it is absolutely a great reason to consider single position lateral and use the robotic instrument to create your accuracy, there is a little bit of workflow you have to get to use, uh, get the entire team used to, to do single position lateral. And if the efficiency makes sense, then it's a wonderful technique. I just simply take the extra 10 to 15 minutes, flip and prone, uh, and hook up the robot. Uh, but there are many surgeons who have a fair amount of experience to, uh, using the single position lateral with uh, uh, pedicle screws placed robotically in the lateral position, and it works great. Thank you, Richard. Uh, 